Okay, there's a little change in terms of what the title is going to be about. Uh, the title is The City as a Living Organism. And really, the lecture that I'm going to, sort of the slide lecture, is really one of, it's really the first part of a whole lecture. Uh, the first part is just dealing with various components that one finds in the cityscape. Uh, I want to begin with a quotation by Gordon Cullen, a uh, English architect. And the quote goes like this, a city is more than the sum of its inhabitants. It has the power to generate a surplus of amenities, which is one reason why people like to live in communities as opposed to living in isolation. Uh, I believe in this very, very strongly. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going to illustrate and lecture to you about the urban landscape. The urban landscape communicates to us in many different ways. Like anything else, it communicates basically in terms of the senses, uh, in terms of sight. There we go. And it communicates in terms of smell. And slides are a little off. It communicates in terms of hearing hearing what you might hear coming from the trickle of water uh, in terms of taste, touch, all of the five senses. Uh, when one thinks of landscape, one has a different connotation than I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the connotation usually is of a natural landscape, something that's very, very serene or peaceful. Something is restful. But the landscape I'm talking about is this, which is not serene necessarily, or peaceful, or restful. It's exciting with a lot of activity. It's sensual. OK, I think they're back in sequence. OK, one of the things that happens in the city is unexpected things, such as this. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. But this is sort of a off-off Broadway happening in Lincoln Center. And as you can see, person with this weird costume is attracting a lot of attention. Uh, these kinds of things don't happen in cow fields in rural environments. They happen in cities. What? Going backwards. Let's, let's hope everything's OK. Uh, when one thinks about an urban environment, this is a normal connotation. Uh, you think of buildings. Uh, you think of people. Uh, there's different kinds. There's basically, as far as I can see, there are two basic kinds of spaces. The two kinds of spaces are enclosed spaces. And the other kind of space is open spaces. The first one is normally manifested in terms of buildings. The buildings change in terms of size and scale depending on the function. Just showed some shots of some urban type buildings. Uh, open spaces are a lot different. Open spaces can be parks, such as this park in New York City. Uh, the only thing natural about this particular park is the trees. Everything else is a man made element. Uh, playgrounds, such as this playground again in New York City that was designed by Paul Friedberg. One thinks of open space, one can also consider streets part of the open space. And streets take on very, very different types of characteristics. All streets do not look like the typical urban strip. Uh, another kind of open space, a little nodes in the pattern of various types of cities. Some of the most interesting open spaces are found in some of the older cities, such as this hill town in uh, Greece. We perceive space, and space communicates to us differently. Uh, it affects us as individuals very, very differently, depending on our background, depending upon our experiences. Uh, and spaces generally, uh, we perceive them differently based on how we enter them, go through them, and pass, pass through them. Uh, the perception of, let's say, entering this particular space and not knowing what is beyond it's very, very different than any of these other slides that I'm showing you. So entrance becomes a very, very important component in 
terms of the urban environment. Is that out of focus? Another thing that, that helps us to perceive space is activity. Uh, and this example is of a street fair. Once every year, for one week, once a year, a particular street fair honoring a Catholic saint occurs on this particular street in Little Italy. Uh, during the other 51 weeks of the year, the street is a normal street with commercial and residential uh, functions. But during this one week of the year, it becomes a street carnival. And every year, it's the same. The only thing that changes is the participants and some of the booths. But it's predominantly the same. Again, this is the kind of thing that the sort of unexpected things that one can expect in an urban environment occurring, even though this is a ritual that occurs every year. Details are another thing that affect, the, affect how we perceive the environment. Uh, if you were like me, when I was walking on this, I was wearing very, very light sandals. I actually could feel what was happening on my, the sole of my feet. It was not only a visual effect, it was a tassel effect. This brings us into the to, to something else which becomes very, very important in terms of the urban environment, and that is the legibility of the urban landscape. Uh, something that I sort of identified as visual character, which is basically a visual description that we ourselves sort of develop about what we can see. One thing that you find occurring in terms of the urban environment is sometimes the images are very, very easy to see and to realize what is happening. But most of the times, there's what I call an image overload. Uh, you don't know where to focus. The only thing that you really know what to do is just to keep walking down the path. It becomes very difficult to stop, especially if it's very crowded, such as in this Mexican market in Mexico City. But there's an overload of information. There's too much information, and it's very, very difficult for us to deal with it. This is especially true in the urban environment. Sometimes, such as in this case, we find it extremely romantic and intriguing. And as a designer, we're very, very much influenced by this sort of organic overload. Uh, it becomes very, very difficult to find the exact path of getting from one point to the other. But in this case, we accept it, especially as designers. We have a tendency to see the things that are really dominant. Uh, such as in this slide here, it's obvious what stands out. It's the azalea, because it's the time of the year for the azalea. This also happens in the urban environment. The dominant things sometimes turn out if there is something which is dominant. Sometimes it's just utter chaos, such as here. But that plaza suite is one thing that you focus on, whether you're walking by or you're going by in a car at 30 miles an hour. What this slide is trying to illustrate is, again, the overload of information. And that this does not necessarily have to be like this in an urban environment. So in order for us to understand what is happening, we have to make sense out of what we're seeing. We have to develop sort of linkages between some of these various components. Uh, and these linkages are important because it, one, gives us a frame of reference. It facilitates easy movement. And it helps us to organize activity. What I want to do now is to look at some of what I think some of the more important things occurring in terms of what I call the vocabulary of the cityscape. Uh, the first one is texture. If you look at an urban environment, if you look at any environment, natural or urban, you find different kinds of textures occurring. Uh, textures do two things. They provide us with a visual stimuli, and they also provide us with something to touch. In this case, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the fine texture of the walls of Ronchon emphasize the form more than the texture. The texture doesn't become a dominant thing. It becomes an emphasis. In this particular wall here of some brick tiles, which occurred, I think it was in Madrid, or either Madrid or Barcelona, you're almost invited to go up and touch it. Uh, it becomes something different than what is occurring in the environment around. It becomes something very, very special. So we begin to realize that textures can do something other than just visually provide us with variety. They can also do something other than just 
something to touch, something to feel on the sole of our feet. They can provide us with direction. They can separate land uses. Uh, they can signify entrance. Or provide direction of where to go. Or the separation of various types of movement. The pattern where the pedestrian is supposed to walk is very, very different than where the automobile is. And this is in its simplest uh, case. Most of those other examples were European. That one is American. The other thing that becomes important in, in terms of texture is in terms of the pad. Uh, one thing that's very, very intriguing about a lot of cities is the variety of types of pads that one finds. Uh, I found this very, very odd. This is occurring in a northern German town, Lübeck. I would have expected a set of stones uh, being on either side of this path, grass. But they wanted to say that this area was different. They didn't want grass, and they placed stone. But they wanted to say that it was different. So there's a different kind of stone than on the path. And Europeans, to me, are a lot more sensitive than Americans are. And this path curves. Not for any real reason. It doesn't have to curve. It could have gone off at a straight angle. But they just thought the relationship between the edge of the building and the path would be a lot more subtle and a lot more interesting if it curved out a little bit. So that's exactly what happened. This I found very odd. This is occurring in Mexico. And it looks like this path was laid at two different times. Uh, very, very different on either side. That's not the photography. That's the way it was. Again, the paths don't necessarily have to be at one level. Again, when this was when this was designed and built, there were no automobiles to be involved with. Most of the traffic was pedestrian. Therefore, we could have these sort of subtle changes instead of ramps. Again, something that is becoming used more and more is pebbles, stones. And these cobblestones are being used in this particular playground. Again, it's a Friedberg playground, which is occurring in New York City. In this one slide, in terms of the design, you can read about four or five different textures, making it a more stimulating environment, supposedly, for children to play on. Also a very dangerous environment. Another important element in the urban scape is vegetation. Vegetation occurs in a very, very different way in the city than it does in nature. In nature, vegetation has a generally dominates the landscape. But in the city, it changes its role. It becomes more of a supportive role, such in this transition between a restaurant and the path getting up to the restaurant. Or it can be used as a design factor or a design tool, uh, such in this park in London. Or it can be used in contrast to some of the grayness occurring in the urban environment, mostly buildings. Uh, or here, the touch of color, the shrubbery, or in this case, it's really a tree sort of overlapping into this Greek street, adds something to the environment. The environment, in my estimation, would be beautiful without it, but it makes it even better with it. A good example of what I think is a very, very good integration between uh, contemporary building and vegetation is occurring in this botanical gardens in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, the setting for the botanical gardens is in a park in the center of Hamburg. A very, very contemporary building, and there's a very, very good integration of building to the landscape and building with the vegetation. Again, plant materials are being used in a variety of ways, in planters or as separate design elements. Another thing that I'm going to be talking about right after vegetation is color. And I think that's another thing that plant materials do. They add color. They help define space. And it's something that can be used and should be used in urban environments. One of the major problems that we're finding in terms of the use of vegetation is maintenance. Plant materials are also used in planters. And these are some shots of 
a variety of planters, some of them built in, some of them occurring above the surface. But take, the, take all of the plant materials out of this slide, and you would have a very, very open, probably very, very cold environment. In this particular case, uh, I wish I had a slide of the buildings occurring on either end, but this was taken in a, a German city, I think it was also Hamburg, and it was a very, very gray street, mostly contemporary gray buildings, uh, gray sidewalks, gray cars, even the people had gray coats on. The plant materials really made it alive, made it much more inviting. Again, referring back to the previous discussion on texture, plant materials, if used properly and if used in a variety of sense, provide a great deal of added texture to the environment. One of the problems with plant materials and one of the pluses with plant materials is they come in a variety of forms. Uh, they vary from season to season. Most of these shots are taken in urban environments. I'm not slipping in any natural environments unless I'm telling you that they are. Like this is a particular rock garden in New York City. Again, talking a little bit about color. Uh, subtle differences in color can be achieved utilizing plant materials just like you can with a palette. And again, if man gets involved, you can really deform plant materials to do exactly what you want them to do. Okay, another thing that I find very, very important, a very, very important component is color itself. And color is manifested in different ways. Uh, take out all the signage and you'd have a very, very dull gray 46th Street in New York City. Uh, and what I want to talk about a little bit is signage and the use of color in signage. This is getting back to something I mentioned earlier. If you look down this street, there's really an overload of information being thrown at you. And it's very, very difficult, even for someone like me who grew up in this environment, to really focus in on something unless I'm looking for something. And even if I'm looking for something in particular happening here, it's going to take me a while to find it because there's so much sort of conflict going on. There's so much chaos. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. In this particular case, this is a building done by a New York architect. He had a very, very low budget. Uh, and what he tried to do is to create a children's museum. And he wanted to say that this was a children's museum. So what he did is he took a little paint and he had somebody paint news on the building. Well, everybody knows it's a museum. In other words, you can use graphics and color to convey messages, and you can do it in a very, very simple way. Or you can simply make a statement about how you feel about life one day, uh, such in this building here. This is a store that's happening in the uh, East Village, and I don't know exactly what they were selling, but the graphic sort of gets your attention. It says that this building is different than every other building happening around it, such as this one here. Uh, somebody either got some very, very bright blue paint very, very inexpensively, or something happened. But the point is he's making a statement. He's saying, I live here. This is the way most of the graphics occurs. Uh, it doesn't have to be like this. I don't know if you can tell, but this sign actually smoked. Sends out puffs up. You can see one of the puffs up in the upper uh, right hand corner. Any kind of gimmick to sell anything. Well, you don't necessarily have to do this. This here, too, is a good combination of what I call very, very bad, well, I don't know why I was going to call it bad architecture, but it's not bad architecture, bad signage. Uh, there's a lot of information being thrown at you, and it's not very clear. Not very simple. Here's some other information being thrown at you, and you get the picture. Somewhere you know, near that graphic, there's a bike shop. And there's some nice little subtle things happening here. I don't know if you can see, but this shows a nice integration of the sign with the environment that's painted on a lot. Uh, 
uh, bikes are always being stolen in New York City. I kind of like super graphics. I like graphics altogether. Here's a particular message, just like McDonald's has its arch. This is the kind of things Nathan's is doing down on 42nd Street to indicate that this is a place to eat. People react to this differently. Uh, this, I think, is probably one of the nicest graphics I've ever found for advertising sake. Uh, occurring on, uh, you can't see it here, but occurring right around the corner, right underneath this, is a hardware store. Simple message, simple symbols indicating what the activity uh, that is occurring inside the building. A lot simpler than that sign that blows smoke out at you. I think it does a much better job. A lot of times graphics are used just to, just to sort of make a statement or just to brighten up the environment, such as this graphic occurring at Pratt Institute, which is designed by a number of uh, of uh, the architecture students. It's a very, very gray environment, as you can see. Uh, the graphic adds a great deal to the environment. In this case, uh, it's a building that came out a little bit further than all the other buildings. Uh, it's a restaurant in the first unisex uh, hairdresser up on top. It doesn't look like a garage inside. But again, making a statement. It's a way of advertising. It's a way of saying, I am there. <clears throat> Sometimes there's a very, very strong message. Uh, this graphic that was designed in conjunction with the community and the School of Architecture at Washington University is doing two things. It's serving two functions. One is just to brighten up an otherwise dull little park. And the second is to show, give a message to the community and pass us by saying, this community is on the move. We're doing something. The sign has since been painted over. The community didn't do very much. Nice graphic, though. And now we're moving backwards. Uh, again, occurring on an upper level. I'm showing this just to show that a lot of the graphics are not, that are used in the city are really not oriented towards the pedestrian. Some of it are oriented towards more semi-public or semi-private spaces, such as this graphic for the Seagram's Building. <clears throat> This graphic is the, the brightest thing occurring on this particular street. I don't think there's really any other message except for the fact that the person who owns this building uses that as a garden area, and I think they're hoping that this is going to make their little garden grow a lot taller. Uh, just brighten up the urban environment. Again, no message. Sometimes these graphics are used in a very, very subtle way, such as in this uh, community pool that we was built in Bedford Stuyvesant. Uh, I think Paul Friedberg also was a landscape architect involved. With. Just a little splash of graphic uh, adds a lot, as far as I'm concerned, to the overall design. Sometimes the graphics, and this is a graphic, this isn't an actual draw, is to commemorate something that was here in the environment that is no longer there. A uh, particular story about this, this occurs in Little Italy, there was a fabulous little bakery. The entrance looked just like that. In fact, the bakery looked just like that, except the bread was fresh and it was warm when you walked in there. Well, there was an expansion of a restaurant, and they knocked out the bakery, and a lot of the people in the community were very disturbed. So they got somebody to let them use the sort of the back part of the store to do this sort of memory of the bakery. The only negative thing about this is that a few months later, after passing by, somebody scribbled graffiti all over it. Again, occurring in Oklahoma City, just a flash of graphics, just to, just to liven the environment up a little bit. The other thing that I, be, that I think is a very, very important component, uh, and there should be another slide, we're sort of reversing again. Uh, is light, artificial light. Artificial light has a way of transforming environments. This should be the first slide. So if I, some of my comments get a little mixed up, please bear with me. Uh, light can transform an environment, especially artificial light. Uh, it can make an otherwise dull space seem very, very much alive. It can also be used just the way color is used to make a statement 
in this particular store, which is occurring uh, in New York City, adjacent to Haley Park, is trying to attract people's attention, saying, "I, we are there. Come and see what's going on. Light can be used for directional purposes. These uh, sky wells occurring, uh, not exactly sure. I think it's in Stockholm. Uh, direction, indicating how one should walk. <clears throat> Another thing that becomes very important are storefronts. Uh, some of them can be, uh, it's very, very important in, in places like New York City or other large cities. Uh, people go to great extents to advertise, to say that they are there. They do this in terms of graphics. They do this in terms of, uh, uh, they do this in terms of advertising. They also do it, I've been finding, more and more in terms of the design of entrances to particular stores storefront facades. This is, this is back in the light. As I said, we're, we're getting mixed up. Uh, this is a shot of Young Street, which is the major shopping street in Toronto. A very, very exciting street. The lights add a lot to it. This is sort of making a statement to people going down the road about what occurs here. Believe it or not, you don't get, you can't get pancakes inside. All you can get is gas and cigarettes. This is another storefront. This one occurs in New York City. Okay, something else which I think is an important component in the environment is water. Historically, a lot of cities have been located uh, on the water's edge because Water was used as a means of transportation. Uh, this is a you know a very very beautiful setting. Water was used in a great deal of other ways other than used as transportation. These are just showing you some examples of that occurring. Water can be used for, for actual functions such as this pool. Uh, it can take on different shapes. It provides us again with something to touch, something to smell something to see. It can provide us with sounds that can sort of uh, buffer some of the sounds of the city. This is a fountain occurring that uh, an architect did in Fort Worth. Sort of an imitation of something I'm going to show a little bit later. Uh, this is not a leak. That's a sort of a water sculpture. It can also provide function. There's all this. This is when this was designed. This was designed to provide people of this community water. But instead of just having a little spigot, they they made a big deal out of it. And I think that big deal adds a lot to the environment in terms of its visual effect. Uh, we're not the only ones that enjoy water, such as these pigeons are doing in this fountain in New Orleans. And water can be very, very subtle within a courtyard, within the urban environment. This is Halpern's Fountain, probably one of the best examples where water is being used as a major component in the design of an urban environment. Uh, Can you just switch one of the slides, make that one go forward, the one that you're at, the other one? Because some of these are going to be sequential. Okay. Okay. One thing that I haven't talked about, which is very, very important, is people. Uh, I've talked about them indirectly, but... I would like to just focus a little bit on people themselves in terms of activity. People are what we design spaces for, whether we're architects or landscape architects. We design spaces for people. A lot of times, people can take an otherwise dull space and make it very, very active. Uh, this is the kind of thing that can occur in very, very different ways. Uh, this woman here has been selling pretzels in this particular corner 
for the last 20, 25 years uh, until the building was torn down. She made her living doing this. The important thing from my point of view is the fact that she made this otherwise very, very dull environment a sort of a little place. When people were in the area, they went there because of the, the fact that they wanted a pretzel, that's where you went. So it became an activity center uh, in a very, very minor way. In a very, very minor way, but yet a major way, this festival occurring again in Lincoln Center. It was occurring on a Sunday morning. Usually on a Sunday morning, the Lincoln Center is just a big, vast, the open space there is a big, vast, sort of monolithic uh, open space. Here, all of this activity is occurring just because of this off-Broadway off festival. Again, uh, my friend, uh, it becomes very, very important. People become very important. People themselves can make a, a place out of a space. So if we design spaces that were places and reinforce the activity and provide it and design uh, spaces that were flexible, uh, and we do that to a degree, I think we could provide a much more stimulating environment. What I want to do right now to sort of finish up is to just go through two or three spaces that sort of mix a lot of these components. Uh, the first one is going to be Rockefeller Center, which was designed back in the 19, I believe, the, the late 30s, or the, or the mid 30s. Uh, when you look at Rockefeller Center, you see some very, very large monolithic gray buildings. Uh, as you get, get closer and closer to the plaza in the center of the complex, you begin to pick up some of the details in terms of the color the vegetation, the flags. There's more, there's more color in the flags than in the people walking by. Remember before I said gray suits? Well, look, there are one, two, three, four gray suits right in the foreground. That wasn't done on purpose. That's the way people dress. A lot of them blend into their environment. Uh, again, you get to the space itself. At this time of year, the space is being used as a restaurant. During the winter months, it becomes an ice skating room. And almost as much, if not more, activity is occurring along the edge than is occurring inside the space. Inside the space, there are direct participants. It's meeting or in the winter time, ice skating. There are always people around uh, watching the activity going in. One thing about urbanites in terms of activity, they like to watch each other. Uh, and it's very nice when we provide spaces for this to happen. The next series of slides are going to be of a streetscape <clears throat> in New York City. Most streetscapes are curbs. There's a sidewalk, then there's the building, and inside the building there's a lobby. In this particular streetscape, or in this particular curb, uh, a designer came along and decided, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to provide people places to watch other people. I'm going to provide some minor activity areas. And although, as a designer, some of the components that we're going to be looking at, I don't particularly uh, think are well designed. They work very well together. What happens here, again, talking about texture and direction, you see a very definite path of where to go. Instead of the, 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 uh, instead of the sidewalk being flat, the sidewalk is being molded to provide little sitting areas to get the building into the street, to make a transition between the building and the activity occurring on the streetscape, which you're going to see there's a restaurant that it comes right up and out. Again, curvilinear path. And as you can see, there are people standing around wanting to sit down. They can't sit down because everybody is busy sitting. And this is just occurring, this isn't occurring at any kind of a special time. It's not occurring, let's say, at the, the noon hour when, when there would be a lot of people out. Again, the restaurant being pulled out off of the building instead of being pushed back. And this is occurring, this particular slide here is occurring on the side street. Not, no, no, not, excuse me, this is occurring on the main street. Another space, and the last space, is a sort of a river park in San Antonio. Again, water becoming a very, very dominant element uh, in the overall design. 
supported very, very much and very strongly with the use of plant materials. Uh, to me, the most important thing that one can say about the San Antonio River Park was that before the park was developed, the buildings backed onto the canal. Uh, now the buildings front the canal. It's the nicest thing in San Antonio. These were taken on a very sort of a mixed day, sort of a, a, a gray day, and the sun popped out every once in a while. It was fairly cool. It was very early in the morning. There's not, as you can see, there's not that much activity. <clears throat> But it's a beautiful, beautiful environment. Uh, very, very highly maintained. As you can see, a lot of activity facing onto the river now. And that's pretty much all new. Another thing about this environment, uh, in terms of, I've basically been talking about aesthetics, it's been an economic boost to San Antonio in terms of attracting tourists and in terms of the uh, new businesses that are occurring along here. One of the major problems with it is it's, it's very expensive to maintain because of the uh, amount of plant materials. It's fairly safe, too. It's patrolled uh, quite frequently. I, I only add that because San Antonio is not noted as being a very, very safe city. Anybody have any questions or anything? Yeah. It runs through, well, the canal runs through the whole city, but the built up park section. Uh, it doesn't run through the whole city. It runs through just basically the downtown. I don't know exactly how long it was. Uh, I was walking it, and it was a very, very long walk. The other nice thing about it is the way it's designed and the use of plant materials there. They provide a nice buffer for all the noise occurring at street level. Uh, the, only, the only thing I find negative about it is it provides the, the plant materials provide a nice buffer. It's also very, very cool down there. When I was there, it was a cool day, and it was a, the sun wasn't exactly when it was out really getting in, warming me up. Uh, but since the San Antonio environment is, is basically a, a hot environment, I would think it would really be a benefit to be where it is. Anybody else? Frieda? The what cityscape? Oh, that's Greece. It's either Mykonos or Santorini. Most of the, all of the Greek slides were of things occurring on a number of the Greek islands. I'm not. I don't know. I can only give you an amateur's view because I, I you know, I'm no, I'm just sort of an observer when it comes to graphics. Uh, so I, I wouldn't even, re I don't know who does better. I, I would think that graphic designers do a better job than architects or landscape architects simply because they're trained that way. Uh, but it depends on the purpose of the graphic. I think if you have a very, very dull environment, some of the graphics I showed, I did not take them because I thought they were very, very good in terms of the graphic design. But if nothing else, they add something to the environment. They don't take away. They add a splash of color. They say entrance. They say, I am here. Uh, and I think a lot of the graphics are being done, and a lot that I showed are not being done by designers. They're being done by just regular, ordinary people.